Soon after the coronavirus arrives inequality and injustice. COVID-19 brought us death after despair in a polarizing world. Korea, the most divided country in the world. Why do we face so much disparity and inequality? What can science tell us? The Science of Inequality and Injustice with Kais Giasai. Welcome to the International Forum of the Kais Global Strategy Institute, GSI. I am Soyoung Kim, Director of the Korea Policy Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution here at Kais. I'm moderating the, the forum today. This is the seventh forum organized by GSI, which is a think tank Kais created three years ago to provide insights on global and domestic issues based on our expertise on science and technology. Today's forum titled The Science of Inequality and Injustice could not come at a better time as we are living in a world of extremes that almost perpetually reproduce inequality and injustice. Unbearable temperature, devastating nature, and also human communities, hyperinflation depriving hard won incomes of ordinary workers and families, pandemic threats to the health of the most vulnerable, horrendous attacks of racism and gender discrim discrimination. Some of these extremes are apparently natural phenomena, but many of them are rooted in certain social structures and relations uh, intricately tied to how limited resources and opportunities are distributed. Inequality is one of the worst ills plaguing virtually every community and society, frequently resulting in various uh, forms of uh, injustice. Social scientists and humanities, hum humanists have studied the causes and consequences of inequality of various dimensions over the past decades or maybe centuries. Most recently, the widely cited works of Thomas Piketty and Michael Sandel have provided hard evidence, logical reasoning, and also deep interpretations of inequality and injustice we are observing these days. Yet, Natural scientists and uh, engineers have also explored mechanisms and forces driving inequality in natural and social worlds, as well as methodologies uh, investigating the problems. Today, we have invited four eminent scholars who could provide some of the best examples of such scientific research on inequality and injustice. For the next one and a half hour, we will have insightful presentations and also dialogues with these speakers and comments. We will first begin with the opening remark by Kaiser President Kwang Yang Lee. Welcome everyone to the 7th Global Strategy International Forum at KAIST. On behalf of KAIST community, I would like to thank the distinguished speakers and the participants for joining us today. Distinguished guests, with the COVID-19 outbreak, our societies have gone through enormous changes very rapidly. And seemingly detached phenomena like the war in Ukraine, climate change, global inflation, and technological revolutions 
uh, ironically impact everyone and all parts of the globe, unveiling some of the inequality and injustice that was still in lingering among us. I wish to utilize this precious time to emphasize how important it is to ensure that the solutions to such global problems does not become new sources of inequalities and injustice. In addition, when devising solutions to such complex challenges of reducing inequality and injustice, I believe we shall not limit ourselves the options by leaving the task only in the hand of social scientists policymakers or political leaders. The time calls for people of sciences to come together to entertain interdisciplinary approaches. In other words, it's time for natural scientists and social scientists and engineers to start collaborating to find the clues to build a fairer and more inclusive world. The world has grown more complex and it is now requires all of us to chip in and do our part. Here at KAIST, we are vigilantly working to take interdisciplinary approaches to research and education to tackle global challenges, including inequalities and injustices through science and technology to make finding and taking inter and transdisciplinary approaches a part of KAIST DNA. In this regard, I'm delighted that we have world-renowned scientists with unpowered insights into the mechanism of inequalities in a variety of forms together strike a dialogue with the social scientists with the expertise in this area. I hope We'll all walk away better ready to create a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Lee, for your warm welcome and also for your tremendous support for this forum. Now let's move on to the keynote speech sessions our, of our four speakers. Uh, let me introduce our first speaker, who's uh, Professor Adrian Bajan. Professor Bajan is the Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering of Duke University. He was already the Benjamin Franklin Medal in 2018 and also the Humboldt Research Award in 2019. His research covers engineering sciences and applied physics, especially thermodynamics design and evolution in nature. Professor Bajan is ranked among the top 0.01% of the most cited and impactful world scientists. Uh, he has authored 30 books and 685 peer-reviewed articles. He received 18 honorary doctorates from universities around 11 uh, countries. Let's welcome Professor Bajan to the forum. Inequality and injustice are two very different concepts. They seem to go together because they also go together with envy. Inequality means difference in size, amount, rank, quality, social position, wealth, and uh, power to push a cart. Injustice, on the other hand, is lack of justice, which means lack of impartiality, fairness, the quality of being right and correct. Inequality is physics, which means nature. It is impossible to efface because freedom is nature. See the inequality in the streams of a river delta and in those of a human lung. They came from incessant freedom to morph. Injustice, like envy, beauty, and time, is a human feeling and belongs to the individual, the observer. An act that feels just to one person may feel unjust to the neighbor. There's a lot to say about uh, inequality and injustice, so I, re I reduced it to three main ideas. First, inequality is physics, or design in nature, and it is predictable. Second, 
Wealth inequality is physics as well. It is the same hierarchy as the hierarchies of energy consumption and human movement, which means life on Earth. Third, when perceived as unjust, inequality can be decreased on the same basis as its origin, which is physics. To predict uh, anything, including hierarchies, one needs a reliable mental viewing, an idea of how something should be, a principle, a law. In uh, our particular discussion, the principle comes from thermodynamics. Nothing moves unless it is pushed. The pushing comes from the work delivered by an engine. The engine is driven by an energy input from an energy source. And uh, the movement caused by the engine um, is uh, dissipating the work or the power by getting the environment out of the way. Everything that we perceive as movement around us fits inside this rectangular box. The air currents, the ocean currents, the animals and the vehicles, and uh, newer concepts that are at once uh, uh, mysterious and um, invisible, such as life matter, robotics, energy materials, sustainability, and climate. The uh, engines and the brakes unite the geophysical with the biological and with the social organization. All these images, all these configurations are evolving as they flow. The uh, principle that summarizes these uh, innumerable observations is the constructor law of design evolution in nature. Or for a flow system to persist in time, which means to live in thermodynamics, it must evolve with freedom such that it provides greater flow access. Uh, here I have a uh, three uh, screen uh, uh, movie of, of the evolution of a river basin. Um, the tape runs from left to right, and that is the time arrow of evolution in nature. Now we have the physics of evolution, which means uh, change after change with a perceptible direction. Now, uh, one of the architectures uh, that uh, is predictable from this uh, principle uh, is the hierarchy. Hierarchies are everywhere, and that is why they go unnoticed. One is the hierarchy of human flow in the city. You see it right here. Um, the population uh, converges in a river basin fashion from the area to one point, for example, a uh, basketball arena. And then uh, two hours later, the same population spreads on the area as a river delta. Um, on a larger scale, uh, what was the grid of the city is the grid of the air routes over Europe. However, the flow of humanity through this uh, uh, seemingly lifeless grid is hierarchical. River basins on top of river deltas. Uh, at the larger scale, which is the globe, is the same phenomenon. We have it uh, here in colors representing the uh, condensation trails left behind all flying aircraft. The world is a vascular flow, which means hierarchical or dendritic. And this drawing shows that uh, the hierarchy in movement is synonymous with a hierarchy in the distribution of fuel used on the globe. And uh, now the um, discovery made in the uh, lower uh, left graph uh, is that uh, the energy used annually by a country or a group of countries is proportional to the reported uh, wealth of that uh, country, the GDP or gross domestic product. Uh, the graph on the right shows the same data on a per capita basis. All the living groups align themselves on the diagonal. So what was the hierarchy in movement and fuel used is the same as the hierarchy in the distribution of wealth on the globe. Now, in a particular uh, group, say a country, the uh, wealth is distributed unequally. Here I have um, data from uh, six uh, countries. And the distribution is more unequal in bigger countries and less advanced countries. And here, here is why, why this should be expected. 
Inequality happens even in the limit when the natural hierarchical flow is destroyed and replaced with a one-size design everywhere as during communism. To see why, consider the flows on these uniform grids of channels, because designs more egalitarian than these do not exist. The square territory is inhabited by identical elements, which are connected by identical one-size channels. Each element receives the same flow input as its neighbor. The flows from the elements are discharged as one stream to one point on the map. So, geography matters. The equals who are positioned close to the point are the beneficiaries. And now you see the physics of the birth of oligarchy in post-communist Russia. The spreading of innovation events over the populated territory is a way to control inequality. Innovation happens when one individual seizes the opportunity to open the flow channel that he or she controls. This is analogous to opening a valve or flipping a switch for the first time. The local design change attracts more flow into the liberated channel. More flow means that the innovator becomes wealthier. And also, the flow or wealth is increased over the entire territory. The entire population becomes wealthier because of a single innovation. The distribution of wealth becomes more equal than in the absence of innovation. The power of innovation on controlling inequality is an argument for teaching and spreading freedom, education, science, technology, and the audacity to question, to take risks, and to be unafraid. New ideas and artifacts spread the flow to distant patches of the territory that are not flowing and not known for generating innovation. Inventions and creative thought tend to occur more in places where they have occurred many times before. This is how the advanced countries, societies, and territories rose above others. They rose naturally because of freedom and because freedom is nature. To read more, I recommend my most recent books. Thank you, Professor Bajan. Uh, although we're going to have a very um, extensive comment later, but I find actually two interesting uh, observations here as a social scientist. Uh, inequality, like other concepts uh, such as hier hierarchy and freedom, actually uh, are the concepts describing uh, natural phenomena. But then uh, it's interesting to see some parallels of uh, inequality in natural and social phenomena like size, uh, distributions of wealth across individuals and um, regions and countries, and especially the last message about innovation, the impact of innovation on the reduction of inequality uh, carries a, a lot uh, of meanings to us. Thank you again. Uh, and our next speaker is Professor Bruce Bohosian, or Bogosian, and former chair of the uh, Department of Mathematics um, at Tufts University. He also has a secondary appointment in the Department of Computer Science too. He co-directs the data analytics program in the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts. Professor uh, Bogosian was elected to a fellowship in the American Physical Society in 2000, named a distinguished scholar of Tufts University in uh, 2010. Professor Bogosian served as president of the American University of Armenia from 2010 to 2014. Professor Bogosian received the Order of the Republic of Armenia from the Armenian Prime Minister in 2014 and also the Gold Medal from Armenian Ministry of Education and Science. His 2019 article titled The Inescapable Casino was published in six languages and also included in the volume The Best Writing on Mathematics 2020. Welcome to the forum, Professor Bogosian. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Is that visible? 
Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to present this research. Uh, the focus of my group's research at Tufts University really hinges on three questions. Uh, why is there wealth inequality in the world? Do wealth distributions have a natural mathematical description? What exactly is oligarchy and what are its origins? A fundamental problem of economics is that of the allocation of limited resources. For example, a village harvests some amount of wheat and how do we decide how many bushels of wheat go to each household in the village? Prior to the 1700s or thereabouts, these kinds of decisions were made by feudal landlords. Now, as long as the landlords were benevolent, the system worked, but there were two problems. I'll say at least two problems. First, not all landlords were benevolent. And second, as the Industrial Revolution made it possible to generate great wealth on a small plot of land, the feudal system came to be regarded as inefficient at best and tyrannical at worst. And so people, and especially the landed gentry who had those plots of land, looked for decentralized free markets where they could trade with each other directly without the intervention of a feudal landlord. Now, a general rule is that whenever the financial incentive is there, a supporting ideology will not be far behind. And in 1776, the Scottish economist Adam Smith posited that free markets of trading agents, each one seeking to maximize their own benefit with prices set by supply and demand, could solve the resource allocation problem without the intervention of a feudal landlord. And so we were encouraged to believe this could create a stable economy in which the solution to the resource allocation problem was obtained naturally as though guided in Smith's words by an invisible hand. But was Smith correct about this? Are free markets naturally stable? Modern neoclassical microeconomic theory teaches us that the answer is yes, but it's yes under certain assumptions about the buyers and the sellers. The buyers and the sellers must act deterministically. They're not subject to unpredictable exogenous shocks. They act rationally. They try to maximize their own benefit or what economists would call utility. They do not make mistakes. They possess symmetric information about what's being bought and sold. They set prices by an auction process. There is always a buyer for every seller. There is insurance that can be bought for any eventuality. These conditions are baked into neoclassical theory, but are they satisfied in real life? It's very telling that so-called heterodox economic theories, such as behavioral economics, for example, typically begin by questioning one or more of these assumptions. But I'm going to take a more intuitive approach here and uh, appeal to uh, a game similar to other games that, that many of us have played, a board game. We instinctively regard equality as a normative state of affairs, but in fact, equality is the very opposite of normative. It is an extremely delicate state of affairs. Anybody who has played the famous game of Monopoly knows it is a winner-take-all game. It results in oligarchy, even though all players start with the same amount of wealth and all players have equality of opportunity in the game. At the end of the game, one player possesses everything and the rest of the players possess nothing. Free market transactions are not all that diff uh, different from the game of Monopoly. So why should we find it so strange that wealth tends to concentrate without limit in free market economies. Now, monopoly games involve very few people typically sitting around a board. In large populations, a different phenomenon can arise. In large populations, it becomes possible for an almost vanishingly small fraction of people to in effect run away with a substantial fraction of societal wealth. 
This phenomenon is called wealth con condensation, and it was first described mathematically by Jean-Philippe Bouchot and Marc Mézard in a paper that they wrote in 2000. In the United States today, for example, the 400 richest people, this is 0.00012% of the population, have approximately as much wealth as the bottom 200 million people, or 60% of the population. This situation is called a partial oligarchy. Those running away with the wealth aren't running away with all of it, but they're running away with a substantial fraction of societal wealth. So a question we can ask is, are real markets naturally stable, naturally oligarchic, or somewhere in the middle, naturally partially oligarchic? Our group has studied a variety of stochastic transaction models, similar, similar in spirit to the game of Monopoly, just appropriately mathematicized. These models consist of idealized agents transacting with one another according to simple mathematical rules and exchanging wealth in the process. In the absence of wealth redistribution, such models may result in oligarchy, even if they are fair, like the game of monopoly. When wealth redistribution is included, these models can exhibit more phenomena. They can also explain empirical wealth distributions with unprecedented accuracy, including the phenomenon of partial oligarchy. In stochastic transition models, each transaction, uh, transaction models, each transaction results in just a trickle of wealth moving from the poorer agent to the richer agent naturally in each transaction. Multiplied, however, by the enormous number of transactions taking place in the world today, this trickle can become a torrent. So even if Adam Smith's thinking were just a little bit erroneous, even if transactions were just a little bit inequality inducing, with the advent of globalization and automated trading over the last three decades, this could amplify his mistake and create the enormous runaway inequality that we see today. The collapse, so we could ask the question now, does free market economics lead to stability or instability? Um, as, as with the former speaker, let me also mention the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991, because that may have given us the closest thing we have to a controlled experiment examining this question it briefly gave rise to one of the freest, I'll put that in air quotes, freest free markets in history. The 15 republics of the Soviet Union were forced to adopt shock therapy economics. And this meant rapid privatization, abandonment of centralized planning, abandonment of protection against foreign competition, suddenly, all at once. The results were economic destruction and mass emigration, a spike in the suicide rate, lowered life expectancy, skyrocketing inequality, and indeed partial oligarchy. Countries that had been socialist republics within less than 10 years became partial oligarchies. The two pictures you see on this slide, I should say I'm giving this presentation sitting in the former Soviet Republic of Armenia. The two houses that you see on this slide are within a one hour drive of where I'm sitting now and most of the rest of the countries of the former Soviet Union uh, and, and Eastern Europe have uh, similar things to show. During the Cold War, the deficiencies of Marxist economics were often pointed out in the press of free market economies. These deficiencies were serious and included shortages of basic goods, the emergence of black markets, lack of incentives, and these were characterized as failures of Marxist ideology. But on the other hand, the ideal of unregulated free markets with privatization and minimized central planning pursued by, for example, the United States since the 1980s has resulted in escalating inequality, supply chain breakdowns, bubbles and market crashes, erosion of democracy due to the growth of oligarchy, depletion of the Earth's natural resources, pollution, species extinction, climate change. At what point do we start calling these a failure of our ideology? 
In summary, what our research is calling into question is not some small detail on the syllabus of a microeconomics course. It is rather two and a half centuries of economic orthodoxy that have led us to believe that prices set by supply and demand will create a fair, equitable, and stable economic system. Empirical evidence strongly suggests the contrary, that free markets are inherently unstable and it is only exogenous redistribution that stabilizes them. Models of inherently unstable markets are able to accurately explain real wealth distributions, including qualitative phenomena, such as partial oligarchy, with unprecedented accuracy. Maybe it's time to take those models seriously. I think the time is long overdue to abandon facile notions that billionaires arise from hard work, cleverness, or value to society. It's time to consider the possibility that escalating wealth inequality is indeed due to a failure of our ideology and one that we ignore at our great peril. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Pohosian, I know your last name is pronounced as Pohosian in your native language, and this is really fundamentally lovely presentation, very insightful and very challenging and very, very so a thoughtful presentation. I'm very deeply moved because uh, as a social scientist, again, uh, you touched upon the very fundamental assumptions of capitalism and also free market economy that uh, we have been questioned only just by, by asking, oh, these assumptions are not real, these sometimes fail, but the model or theory is correct. But then now what you're saying is uh, there is an intrinsic mechanism underlying the inequality arising from um, the working of uh, capitalism, especially trickling up rather than trickling down of wealth, can actually result in huge uh, accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few. And um, well, I cannot really go along, but this is very, very insightful presentation. Thank you again. Our third speaker is Professor Esteban Moro, professor at the University Dad Carlos III, Third, uh, the Madrid uh, of Spain. Professor Moro serves as a consultant for many <clears throat> public and private institutions and also has held very prestigious positions at the University of Oxford and the Institute of Knowledge, Engineering, and many more. His areas of interest are applied mathematics, financial mathematics, uh, and social networks. Professor Moro received the Shared University Award from IBM in 2007 for modeling the spread of information in social networks and application to viral marketing. Um, thank you for uh, joining the forum. Uh, Professor Moro, over to you. Thank you. hope you can see my slides and hear me correctly. You can nod. Uh, someone you. You yes, can hear yeah. me well. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Sister Amor. Thank you very much for organizing to having me today. I'm, I'm talking today from Boston, from MIT, when I'm a visiting professor here. So I'm going to change a little bit the gears um, here, and I'm going to talk about a specific aspect of inequality, which is how inequality is represented in the urban space. And specifically, the representation, the spatial representation of, of inequality in our cities is what we call segregation. The fact that we live apart from each other, the fact that many groups which are rich don't see poor people or the other way around. And I'm gonna uh, make a call because actually what has been in the last hundred years has been a, a, a constant but uh, increasing erosion of the social fabric in our cities. Uh, although it's well known that communities that in which social capital is high and diverse are healthier, wealthier, happier, and feel stronger both the neighborhoods and the communities in general, what has happened in the last years, especially, has been this thing, like we have been polarized into groups. We have been, we have less friends that are basically different from us, and we have less, and rich people actually don't see poor people, etc. So there, there has been a progressive erosion of this social fabric. And what we wanted to understand from our uh, point of view is if we can say something about how this erosion has been, and specifically, what is the role that the urban environment and the places that we have in our city placing this uh, social erosion. 
And not only because in general, social capital is an idea that actually, um, um, I mean, can be elevated to say to, to even predictive modeling. Uh, uh, we can actually see that social capital is related to many, many processes, like for example, social mobility, but also to uh, economic growth of areas. But also because segregation, the, the spatial structure of inequality in our cities has actually a tremendous cost, not only for the people living in those areas. Obviously, for example, you see, for example, that in the United States, the people which are living 200 meters apart, they have up to 10 to 15 years less of lifespan of, of actually um, um, expectancy, uh, life expectancy. Only living 500 meters uh, uh, apart, they can have this sudden gradient of life expectancy. But also because cities that are uh, more segregated, they have higher oversight rates, they have a slower economic growth, and they are going to be less innovative in the future. So segregation has a cost for all of us. And the question is, if we can uh, give another perspective to this education, this inequality that has been in the cities from our point of view. In order to do that, uh, most of the research that has been talking about segregation in cities and inequality cities is uh, also uh, Professor Bogosian was showing a very similar uh, photograph. Uh, this is actually the city of Mexico. Um, most of the studies about segregation in city is about places. It's about bricks. It's about roads. It's about buildings. It's about telling you that you are where you sleep, basically. It's about what is called residential segregation. So typically in cities, you have something like this, in which the, the, say the neighborhood on the right seems to be more affluent, while this, the neighborhood on the, right, on the left hand side is more uh, slum-like, so it's probably poorer than the, the one on the right hand side. So segregation most of the times is understood as the spatial structure of where people live, but this doesn't tell you anything about where people go. What is the behavior of people? And if the people on the right hand side talk to the people on the right on the left hand side, or there is actually community spaces in which these uh, people that are uh, living in these two different uh, areas get together. In the last uh, 20 years, we have been working actually in trying to understand the human behavior using uh, different data sources. And every one of us actually has a huge sensor that we carry every day that is actually telling a lot of information about our human behavior. And that sensor is actually our mobile phone. And there are many, many data sets that you can extract from the mobile phone. And we have been actually using all of them to understand problems like resilience after natural disasters. We have been looking, for example, in the social structure of uh, places like, for example, in Europe, in, the, in South Africa, et cetera, um, understanding, for example, refugees, I mean, how they integrate in societies. Today, I'm gonna to talk about segregation, but we have been doing a lot of work using this, mo this mobility, this mobile phone data to understand human behavior. There are many data sets that you can get and the many sensors that you have in your mobile phone. For example, in the last COVID, in the last pandemic, there was a lot of applications that were using your Bluetooth to, for contact tracing. But the, in, in the talk that I'm going to talk about today, uh, we were using data that comes from your GPS. Basically, we got access to the, the location of people and trace the movements of people throughout the day in cities. And when we did that, we found something astonishing. The what we found is actually that 75% of the people that you encounter every day in the United States live more than 15 kilometers away from you. So if there is segregation in the city, if there is the, the thing that there's a limitation for us to encounter people, more diverse people in the city, it doesn't have to do, it have, probably doesn't have to do much with where we live. It has to do with where we go and actually where we work, etc. Okay, so the question still that we want to answer is that if we are segregated, if there's this inequality of the, on, the, on the diversity of people that we encounter every day, the question is where this is happening? And obviously, why this is happening? What is the behavioral root of the segregation between people? Okay, so what we did, I'm gonna tell you the where and the why. So the, the first thing we did was actually to find what places serve as uh, this potential mixing places for people to encounter themselves in the city. And we built what we call the Atlas of Inequality, which is basically the projection of all these billions and billions of data that we got from mobile phones uh, into this Atlas in which basically what you see here are points. Each point is a, is a venue, it's a public venue, and it's colored according to the diversity, to the, the inverse of the inequality of that place. Meaning that a red point is a restaurant in which only people from one economic background goes there. While a blue point is a place that uh, is visited by all the economic, let's say, groups in the city. 
This is, uh, we did this for 11 cities in the United States, and we are actually expanding this to other countries in the world. But you can see here, here things which are expected, like for example, downtown Manhattan, this is actually New York, and downtown Manhattan, you see a lot of bluish points because there are a lot of people actually from different backgrounds that get together in restaurants, in I don't know, shops, in I don't know, art, et cetera. But then when you move away and you go to the Bronx or you go to Queens or the Brooklyn or even to New Jersey, you start seeing a lot more reddish points. But there are two striking things that we found in this data set. The first one is that segregation in our cities happen from one side of the street to the next, to the other side. So this is actually what happens very close to where I, I work at the Media Lab. So someone, I mean, probably you know the MIT, this is Main Street. And there are two places that you can get a sandwich for $10 in each of them, one is Chipotle and the other one is Clover. And you can see that they're very different uh, patterns of visitation by different groups. So Chipotle is visited by any income from poor to rich people. While Clover Food Lab is only visited mostly by, by rich people. So just by walking 50 meters, you can be segregated if you want. You don't have to go to the, I don't know, to the poor neighborhoods. You can be segregated by just walking 50 meters and deciding which type of sandwich you want. And actually, this is what we found. This is a very complex plot. Let me explain to you. This is a plot in which each, each uh, bubble that you see there is the average segregation of all the places in the United States that belong to a specific category. So this is, for example, this is the vertical direction. This is the average segregation of all the schools in the United States, of all the high schools, all the middle schools, all the elementary schools, etc. And the horizontal dimension is the distance that you have to travel to get there, okay? So you see the, the things here which are expected. Like for example, you have to travel 25 kilometers in the, in the in a city in the United States to go to the airport, but you only have to travel less than 10 kilometers to go to the elementary school. You see here that there's a correlation between the two, right? I mean, like, if, and that's expected because uh, the more unique places, like for example, an airport, there's only one of them and it's very mixed. An airport is very mixed because everybody has to go to the airport rich people and poor people together. But even, the, even though there's a strong correlation between them, you see, still see a lot of variability. For example, if you, have, you go to work, typically in the United States, people travel around 40 kilometers to, uh, in commuting uh, every day, 20 kilometers go and, and back and forth, okay? Um, and this is actually the distance you see here for the, for the pinkish, let's say, plots. If you work in an office, you are likely to be less segregated than you work in a factory in a warehouse. You travel the same distance, but you are likely uh, to be uh, differently segregated. So the places that you visit, the places that you have to go because of your activity, your professional career, uh, even your interest, actually are gonna determine how much segregated you are in your daily life. Is that so that even the type of food, the type of food, this is the same plot, but for the type of restaurants in the United States, even the type of food segregates you differently. If you like Tex-Mex, this is the less segregated places in the United States. But if you like Spanish or Caribbean food, you're going to be much more segregated. By the way, you see, see things here, which are um, for the people, we are work, also working in the nutritional part of this plot. And you see things here, which are really uh, depressing from the point of view of nutrition and also inequality, is that the most caloric, the most fast food, the most uh, processed food uh, that you uh, um, take into your diet, the more segregated you're going to be. All the fast food is actually one. So the places that you go because of your activity matter a lot. And it's actually going to determine how much, how different people you see every day. But obviously the question is, again, coming back to the original question, why? Why we are, some people are segregated uh, and some people are not segregated? And what is the role that, for example, residents, the place that you live, plays in that experience segregation? So what we did is very simple, is we calculated the Gini coefficient by person. So instead of calculating the Gini coefficient by, I don't know, the, the inequality coefficient by city, by neighborhood, we did it by, by person, by computing the places that you go to. And looking at the places that you, at the people that you see every day, we can actually compute the Gini coefficient, how unequal is the people that you see every day. So you have a, a, an inequality of 100%. If you just see people of your own income, and you have an equality of 0% if you see people from all incomes in the city. So this is actually, for example, could be me. And then we basically run a number of models in order to understand which part of your activity, either the choices that you make, or for example, how far you go from your place, 
or even the, the demographic variables, like for example, your income, your educational level, the region you, you, you live, et cetera, how much do they wait to explain the final segregation, the final individual segregation that a person experiences every day? And what we found is actually that choices, the places that you visit, your lifestyle accounts for 45% of the variability in the segregation that we observe. And income, only 10%. And actually, education is only 7%. So that means that most of our segregation, the experience segregation that we feel every day, and the fact that we, we don't encounter people from other, other places, is encoded into our lifestyle. It's not encoded into the place that we live. So how can, can we create more, more resilient societies? So this is a very complex process because inequality and the spatial manifestation of inequality in our cities, which is segregation, is, be, is depends on the urban environment because urban environment determines the, the human behavior and the human behavior determines social connection. And that also implies or, uh, or gives or deals to different societal outcomes. This is traditionally how this process has been thought, and there has been many, many research about finding the impact of urban environment in, for example, inequality, finding the, the impact of behavior in social connection, etc. But the problem is that we live in a complex world, and as uh, Christopher Alexander said, the city is not a tree. So what happens actually is that there are many connections between these boxes. So what we are trying to do in our group is actually to isolate, to try to find new ways to look at these um, this links between this, uh, these boxes. By the way, um, um, I have bad news because we have been looking at in the last three years, how this inequality has evolved in our cities, how this segregation has evolved in our cities. There has been never a most segregated time in our world that March 2020, because everybody was staying at home we were the most segregated in March 2020 as we have been ever in our cities in the last 100 years. And unfortunately, because people are coming back to uh, their activities, we see a lot of activity and we see the markets actually, uh, well, apart from inflation, et cetera, but still we are 15% more segregated than we were before the pandemic. And the reason you can imagine is because we're working from home. We are not going to food restaurants because we have delivery. People are not going shopping. So the pandemic has actually has created a permanent effect in, our, in the social fabric of our societies, which we are trying to find. Uh, we are trying to find the reasons uh, of the, the best policies that we can, we can implement to fight this uh, segregation in our cities. Thank you very much. And I'm, well, I'm hoping I, I convince you that we have to look differently at this problem and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Professor Moro. This is a very exciting uh, project. I have actually taken a look at uh, your project, and it was a little bit hard to understand initially, but in terms of graphics and also the models, uh, they look very um, intuitive, especially using these high-resolution res data to reveal segregation patterns, especially on the dimension of a behavior. Uh, that's a very new approach, I guess, because uh, political scientists and sociologists have been studying racial segregation uh, for a long time uh, in terms of residential segregation or income uh, differences, but this is very unique uh, uh, in that sense. Okay, the last speaker uh, is Professor Stefanie Stencheva uh, from Harvard University. Uh, she is Nathaniel Ropes, Professor of Political Economy and the founder of the Social Economics Lab. Uh, Professor Stencheva is a member of the French Council of Economic Analysis, and her work has centered around the long-lasting effects of tax policy on innovation, education, and wealth. In 2018, the Economist selected Professor Stencheva as one of the eight best e young economists of the decade. Uh, she was also awarded the Elaine Bennett Research Prize in 2020. Professor uh, Stencheva is currently co-editing the famous, famous quarterly journal of economics. So let's welcome Professor Stencheva to the forum. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the organizers um, and thanks to the speakers. It was really fascinating talks. Um, today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the policy action you know, potentially against inequality uh, and talk about um, how social economic surveys and experiments can help us determine what drives our support for redistribution. 
so when we think about redistribution policy, um, we think of things like progressive taxation, social insurance, um, all these programs that can help reduce inequality. And one question that we've been asking at the Social Economics Lab is, what shapes people's support or opposition for such programs? Um, inequality has been rising. We saw that in the previous three presentations. Yet policy action is not necessarily something people agree on. Um, and so what we what we use as a research tool here is social economic surveys and experiments. So what are those? These are essentially large scale in-depth surveys that try to really get into people's minds and see how they reason. Uh, they try to understand how people understand economic policies. What do they know about them? Uh, what is important to them? What do they perceive as the economic effects, as fairness concerns, et cetera? And what is different here from previous surveys, of course, surveys have been around for a very long time, and traditionally they've been used uh, to measure things that today are potentially much better measured uh, in, in big data or in administrative data. Uh, Professor Morrow's research was a great example here. We don't necessarily need to ask people today in surveys, where do you go, where do you buy your food, et cetera. This can be seen in many other data sets. Yet there are things that we still cannot see in such amazing big data. And those are things like perceptions, attitudes, knowledge, your views, et cetera. And so this is where these social economic surveys come in to really try to dig into those things. So I wanted to give you a little sort of mental model um, of how we think about redistribution policy before I dive into some specific results. So if you think from a very um, very high level perspective. If you think about a policy like progressive taxes and think, should I support this policy or not? Then implicitly or explicitly, you are forming views on at least these four factors. The first thing you're going to form a view about is what do you think the economic effects will be of that policy? For instance, do you think that if we tax high income people more, they're going to stop working or evade taxes more, save less, etc.? So those are the economic costs we have in mind. The second thing you'll form a view on is who do you think will gain and who do you think will lose from this policy? Again, if we tax you know, high income people, do you think they will be the ones hurt or potentially everyone will suffer from this? The third thing that we tend to form views about is our fairness concerns. So to put it simply, fairness concerns can really be formalized as the weight we will put on winners and losers. So how much weight do you put on people who will gain? How much weight do you put on people who will lose? So how do you aggregate those gains and losses? And this is related to questions like, how fair is inequality to you in the first place? What do you think generates income inequality? Is it differences in luck? Is it differences in effort? Is it differences in education, et cetera? And then finally, um, we also form some views about the government and not necessarily a specific administration, but rather the government as an institution. How much do we trust it? Um, how benevolent do we think it is? How much should there be? And if we think about all these factors, something that comes out very strongly in many countries and that I summarize on this slide here is that we have very different views about redistribution policy, for instance, tax policy. And in many countries, the divide is very much by sort of political affiliation, uh, almost tautologically. So if you're someone who's more on the left, you will tend to think that taxes have less economic costs. So when we tax more, we're not going to hurt the economy as much. Opposite of that on the right. On distribution uh, concerns, you will tend to think that uh, if I raise taxes at the top, there's not going to be this trickle down idea. So uh, it's not going to be the case that if I tax top earners less, everyone will benefit. It's not going to be the tide that lifts all boats. You will tend to also think in general related to fairness that inequality is broadly unfair and that luck or things outside of your control tend to be important determinants of income. If you're someone on the right, you will tend to think that individual effort or merit is a much more determinant uh, factor for income inequality. And then when it comes to views of the government, people on the left will tend to generally think a government is something that should have a broader scope that should intervene more, and the opposite of that if you're someone on the right. And then something that's really interesting, which I've put in the last bullet here, um, is that even on reality, we tend to differ. And we call that the polarization of reality, which is even for basic facts that you can potentially go and check on, on Google, like for instance, what is the top tax rate in the US today? 
or what share of income is earned by the top 10%. Even on these basic facts, people will actually disagree and have a different number in mind, depending on whether they're on the left or on the right. Um, and so this is why this is called the polarization of reality. So if you're someone on the left, you will tend to think that taxes today are already lower and less progressive, and that there's more inequality than someone on the right. But all these factors, of course, you know, are important and play into our perceptions and views on policy. But what is the most important one? Well, the research we've done shows that actually, if you horse race these considerations, what comes out on top in the end when it comes to redistribution is who people think wins and loses and how fair they think that is. So those are really the key factors that will swamp all other considerations. So yes, people disagree on what are the economic costs of various redistribution policies, but that's not the major determinant of their final support. Someone can think, for instance, that progressive taxation will have high economic costs, yet still want to do it because they think that inequality is very unfair. And so really, the key driver of our policy views is what we think is fair and who we think gains and loses. But the complication, of course, is that fairness is a, is a vague notion and is something that's very much in the eye of the beholder. So it means different things to different people. And so the some of the factors that we've looked into that shape how fair people think redistribution policy is and how much they support it are listed here. And I can only briefly go through three of them, actually. Uh, one is perceptions of social mobility. So how is income even formed? Is it due to yourself or due to your parents? Uh, people's views about immigrants. And then how you think you rank relative to others in society. So in the very short time, I wanted to briefly talk about these uh, three things here. So the first is about social mobility. So how is that related to your views on fairness? Well, in general, when people think that you had more equality of opportunity to start with so that everyone has the same chances, then people are much more willing to tolerate inequality of outcomes because they think that this inequality is caused by personal effort, by personal merit. If you think there's little equality of opportunity, so the playing field is already rigged, uh, you're much less willing to support inequality. And in this project, we looked at uh, five countries and surveyed people about their notions on social mobility. Do they even understand the extent of social mobility? But most importantly here, on the link between their perceptions of mobility and their support for redistribution policy. And what we find is that most people are quite worried about lack of social mobility. So it's a very bipartisan consensus. People don't love it when your children's outcomes are very closely linked to their parents' income. Yet uh, the solutions that people perceive for this problem and that they want are very different. So if you're someone who's more on the left and you are more pessimistic about mobility, you will want more government action. So you want more progressive policies, also equality of opportunity type policies like education and health. And this is true if you do an experiment as well, where you show people negative information about mobility, you see for left-wing leaning respondents, their support for redistribution increases strongly. On the other hand, if you're someone on the right, you'll tend to view the government rather as the problem, part of the problem rather than the solution. And your preferred solution uh, to improve equality of opportunity and mobility will be to actually have less government intervention. The second, um, thing that really shapes people's views on fairness is who's the beneficiary of the redistribution. And that brings us to the issue of immigration, because there are a lot of theories out there um, that generosity doesn't travel as well across ethnic, national, or religious lines as it does within. And people dislike, you know, giving money or redistributing when they think it benefits others who are different from them. And so we wanted to see if that's true here. And so we did these large-scale surveys in six countries. Uh, trying to see, do people know who immigrants are, how immigrants look, what their characteristics are, and how do their views on immigrants shape their support for redistribution policy? So very briefly, what we find, first of all, is that there's extremely stark misperceptions about immigrants across all these countries. Um, so most people have very inaccurate views and tend to think that immigrants are economically weaker, more unemployed, less educated, more reliant on government transfers and more culturally distant from them too. And although misperceptions tend to be larger for some people than others, these are very common misperceptions across all the respondents. 
And what we see is that there is a quite tight link between your views on immigration and your support for redistribution. And in particular, we do an experiment where we ask half the sample questions about immigration before we ask them questions about policy and vice versa for another randomly selected half of the sample. And what we see is that just making people think about immigration without giving them any information before asking them questions on policies makes them significantly less supportive of redistribution. So just making you think about immigration induces this reaction that's anti-redistribution. And we can map it to the underlying views of immigrants by showing that it's mostly for people who think that immigrants are economically weak, and especially if they think that immigrants free ride, so to speak, on the welfare system. So if they think that immigrants are the beneficiaries of redistribution. And then very briefly, the third um, concept that's related to fairness that I wanted to talk about that really shapes people's views on what is fair is how you rank yourself relative to others. So this project is actually based in Denmark, where we had this great opportunity to match tax data. So your tax returns that you fill out for the government, we were able to match those to a survey we designed so that we can ask people to rank themselves among many reference groups, like among their neighbors, among people in the workplace, among people uh, of the same education as them in Denmark, people in the same city, et cetera. And we can actually cross check the true ranking that they have from the tax data. And what we see is actually summarized in this key graph here that I wanted to show you, which is if you plot people's actual position, let's say in their cohort, so everyone born the same year as you, the actual position is on the horizontal axis. And then you plot people's perceived position on the vertical axis. You see this inverted S-shaped pattern uh, that we call center bias, which is that people who are ranked lower will tend to think they're ranked higher actually, and people who are ranked higher will tend to think they are ranked lower. And this is not a mechanical effect. So it's not driven by um, a direction bias that you can only underestimate if you're at the top and overestimate at the bottom. We show that this is not the case. This is actually systematically due to the fact that if you are poor, you tend to think everyone else is poorer too. And if you're rich, you tend to think everyone else is richer too. So your own income really shapes your views about how rich or poor others are. And this is true for the cohort, but it's true on this graph for all other reference groups. So if I'm asking you to rank yourself among other men or women, uh, or in your city, or among people with the same education, et cetera, we will always see this misperception pattern. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because we can see which type of inequality people consider to be most unfair. And we see that it's actually inequalities between people with the same education or people in the same sector or firm that people tend to consider as most unfair relative to say inequality within a city or inequality within a cohort. Yet these are exactly the inequalities that people are most confused about and where people tend to really underestimate the extent of inequality. And we can also see in this project that uh, people who are ranked higher in any group will consider inequality to be more fair. So if you're doing better relative to others, you will say inequality is more fair. And we can see that when things happen to you over life, for instance, if you have good events like promotion at work, you'll tend to think inequality is more fair. And if you have bad events like unemployment shock or a health shock that shifts you down relative to others, you will start saying that inequality is more unfair. And finally, we can also see this uh, by telling people where they truly rank in the distribution. And those who are told that they rank lower will tend to think inequality is now less fair. So I hope this gave you a bit of a glimpse into what we can achieve with such large scale surveys and how it gives us some idea about what sort of factors uh, affect people's views on fairness, which is the core determinant of our views on progressive policies. And of course, there are many more factors to study. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stencheva. This is very, very interesting um, talk, especially in the previous presentations uh, describing or identifying the mechanisms of inequality. This one actually reveals how people actually think about uh, inequality or fairness. And these are the very people experiencing and also suffering from inequality. Sometimes their perceptions are not in the directions we expect to be. Wow. That's a very interesting finding. Um, so uh, thank you all four speakers for your impressive presentations. We're going to start uh, the discussion session soon. 
uh, with the in-depth comments on these presentations by Professor Won Jae Lee here at KAIST after a brief intermission. Conflict. Inequality. How can we understand it with science? Equal. All flows of the world follow the same system. Wealth inequality viewed through that very flow structure. Exceedingly natural and mundane heterogeneity. From there, new questions are discovered. Justifications and contradictions the rich make regarding wealth inequality. Probability of profit, open for everyone. Equal opportunity given to everyone. Then where do inequality and injustice come from? Your experiences with injustice. Your experiences with locations. Are they really unrelated? Read on place inequality with a new map. What is fairness? Innovative public policies and optimal taxation. Examining public perceptions and attitudes to reduce inequality. Eyeing equality and justice with science. Expanding our vision for the future. Heist GSI International Forum. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to start the discussion session uh, by the comments uh, of Professor Won Jae Lee. Professor Lee is a social scientist like myself here at KAIST who contributed an interdisciplinary research article to PNAS, uh, Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, for the first time in South Korea as a sociologist. And as a colleague, I am very proud, of course, and also I view him as one of the best social scientists at KAIST who are willing and also able to collaborate with engineers and scientists. So I think he is the best person to comment on the presentations today. Okay, Professor Lee. Thanks for having me in this wonderful forum. Uh, I'm Won Jae a sociologist in this science and engineering school. I'm very excited to have a chance to talk with the inequality scholars from natural engineering science and economics, which I could hardly interact with as a professional sociologist. However, it is not strange we are engaging in the same topic today. The name of sociology in her childhood was social physics. One of the first masterpieces of American sociology, written by a Harvard sociologist, was meant to be read by Harvard economists in the early 20th century. Today, I'd like to present three questions in response to the four wonderful speeches. First, state of nature. Let me start with Professor Bayan's proposition that inequality is physics, impossible to efface, Injustice is human perception and belongs to the individual, the observer. It reminds me of Jean Jacques Rousseau's distinction between physical and moral inequality. It means inequality resides in two confronting domains, which are nature and human. Rousseau and Professor Bayan are on the same page because at this point they are indeed defining a state of nature. It is actually provoking social scientists like me. I got the same feelings when I came to read Barabashi's Scale-Free Network paper 20 years ago, where the state of nature was an extremely unequal distribution of everything, including human networks. 
For me, it sounds like any artificial, political, and institutional response to the physical inequality would ultimately be unnatural. The Kai, Jera, and Kafa in Professor Bogosian's elegant model of gambler's fallacy also have a same implication. Depending on his findings, what if we formulate a law calibrating the three parameters so wealth can trickle down? Would it ultimately be natural or unnatural? It is related to my second point, attraction versus repulsion. In Professor Moro's uh, confound the free network analysis, which is extremely hard to achieve. Congratulations. The network is indeed a matrix of job skill similarity. The thing is that uh, probably the most typical example of a resilient job network would be found in old rural area, rather than in large cities. In countryside, jobs are homogeneous and tightly knit. Communities as such are conservative and resilient to environmental changes. Then the question is how diversity in large cities comes along with the large scale integration. One famous answer is weak tie and small worldliness out of it. Then how weak tie can exist? Weak tie is revolving around a certain type of social relationship, which is repulsive rather than attractive. It has an interesting implication for Professor Bayan's claim that his view of science would nullify the contradiction between freedom and rule. But sociological network theory does not nullify the contradiction. We embrace it. Lastly, state of nature versus the null hypothesis of equality. The unequal distribution of wealth in human society is conditioned and sometimes reinforced by the artificial efforts to rectify it. The misperception of public policy, Professor Sancheba convincingly analyzed, could be one of the reasons. I think the misperception also springs from the too much dependence on the idea of the state of nature. By definition, it can never be overcome. To understand how unequal we are, what we need is not the unshakable state of nature but the null hypothesis of desired and attainable degree of equality. The Thomas Piketty's description of contemporary inequality is surprisingly ahistorical, I think. The level of 21st century inequality reaches that of early 20th century London, but the lowest class in UK at the time were living in a, a way better life than their grandfathers before industrialization. Inequality in modern times is correlated with the economic growth by which inhumane poverty disappeared. Historically speaking, the public policy for leveling up the average wealth has been a better conceived and effective way of addressing the issue of economic justice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. As expected, he gave very, very uh, insightful uh, comments, and some of them are very theoretical. So I guess our speakers uh, have much to respond to his uh, comments. And because of the time, I'd like to add my own questions so that each uh, speaker can actually respond to Professor Lee's comments and also my own uh, questions. Uh, so I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, while inequality is quite pervasive in natural and social science uh, words, and also extreme inequality in some sense is inescapable in the free market economy, how or what can policymakers and ordinary citizens like us in the real world uh, hope for? And how underlying understanding these underlying mechanisms of uh, inequalities can help us better the situation. And also with those interesting uh, socioeconomic uh, models um, also captured through, I mean, I mean socioeconomic inequalities captured through much more sophisticated data and models and also sifted through fundamental perception gaps on redistributive policies. I wonder whether there are any specific examples 
uh, of or recommendations for giant steps or even granular changes to make on existing uh, institutions or policies because I'm essentially a public, public policy scholar. So I'd like to ask each uh, speaker in the order of a presentation give some responses to uh, the comments by Professor Lee and also some questions I raised. Professor Beijing. Yes, um, first, uh, I didn't have a chance to thank you very much for inviting me and especially for reading my book, Freedom and Evolution. That's, uh, I think, the reason why I was invited. So I really appreciate this. I'm a former uh, presenter at KAIS, so I'm uh, uh, a friend of your institution. Uh, now, uh, I'll begin with a, with a brief correction to what you just said. Uh, inequality is not a feature of uh, the free market. Uh, it is a feature of any society, including communism. Uh, I'm not sure if, whether or if any of you have lived under communism I mean, to grow up and to see everything going on. I did. And uh, it is from that experience, which then was followed at age 20 of uh, living in the United States, that I, I saw the physics of what I just described on that, uh, on that video. And uh, inequality is uh, a, a feature of communism. Uh, there was a takeover uh, of a country, in my case, Romania, by the, uh, by the Soviet army. And overnight, uh, the communist regime uh, proclaimed equality. And then one week later, there was a new hierarchy, a much steeper one. And of course, you have that uh, in the North Korea today in any totalitarian country. So uh, I am a, free, a fan of the free market and inequality is not the baby of the free market. Um, um, in your correspondence with us before this uh, discussion, you asked us to comment on this great quote from, uh, from uh, Aristotle. Well, it's a great quote and it has morphed into a few other great quotes um, from, uh, from Cervantes. Uh, here is Don Quixote saying this to Sancho. Bear in mind, Sancho, that one man is not more than another unless he does more than the other. That's, uh, that's uh, 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 one, uh, one answer to all of us. Um, a few uh, centuries after that, we have uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, of the United States. Uh, which second paragraph begins with withhold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, these are uh, words that I addressed in my uh, nine minute video, and uh, they have to do with the individual who, uh, in fact, uh, uh, acts in his own interest in, in life. So, uh, but the bottom line of these quotes is that uh, the origin of hierarchy, uh, which is natural, as I showed, the origin of hierarchy lies in equal access and freedom. In other words, the beginning is equal access, and then the rest of the life of an individual um, is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, unwittingly to, for the individual, imbibed an infinite freedom to make, to make choices. And now finally, uh, the, uh, I correct the credit was given to the uh, uh, economic development, which uh, enriched everybody. Well, uh, the, uh, in, from my point of view, the reason for that economic development was the uh, unstoppable arrival of new ideas. Um, the invention of steam power in Great Britain made uh, Bolton and Watt rich and the whole world, beginning with the British Empire, the richest. The invention and distribution of electric power uh, was the similar event due to Tesla and Westinghouse. Uh, the awakening of, to economic activity in hot and humid tropical in equatorial areas, uh, which was thanks to an inv the invention of air conditioning by Willis Carrier in 1902. And, uh, and of course, we have the never-ending 
inventions in communications uh, all the way from uh, moving type to uh, to uh, the iPhone and the internet you know you know that the particular aspect of the present so this is why now coming to uh, what to do about inequality i repeat the punchline of my video which is um, uh, <laughs> teach <laughs> teach your children and your students to uh, ask uh, questions and to be unafraid and to um, defend their original ideas. This is how uh, tomorrow will be better. And um, I'll stop here. Thank you, Professor Bajan. Uh, well, uh, the quote from uh, Aristotle that he was mentioning uh, is actually uh, this. Injustice arises when equals are treated unequally, but also when unequals are treated equally. But I really like that um, third, uh, the quote that you gave uh, for a quick study, uh, Don Quixote. Uh, I'm going to move to the next speaker uh, for the response, Professor Bogosian. Um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to contemplate to what extent one can control public policy to reflect the will of a society. There was some beautiful work by um, Dan Ariely and Michael Norton uh, about 15 years ago or so, um, in which they very cleverly surveyed people uh, in order to understand what their perception was of real inequality in the United States um, and uh, what level of inequality they would like to see in the United States. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the spoiler alert here. Um, most people's perception of inequality in the United States is in fact uh, much, much less than what inequality really is in the United States. And what they would like to see is in turn less than what they think it is. Um, it is very difficult. I, I completely agree that it's, it's a state of nature that causes inequality to develop. When it develops beyond a certain point, however, it, it, there, there is a limited amount of inequality people would like to see um, when it develops beyond a certain point, it begins to interfere with what we would normally regard as freedom. For example, there is a strong correlation between inequality as measured, for example, by the Gini coefficient and upward mobility. As inequality increases, upward mobility decreases. This is an effect that economists call the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, it's, it's been known empirically by macroeconomists for some time now. So uh, when inequality increases uh, too far, the ability to rectify it for people to, um, uh, uh, to actually move up the economic ladder uh, decreases uh, and it becomes a runaway process. Uh, the other, going to the quote by Aristotle, uh, injustice arises when equals are treated unequally, but also when unequals are treated equally. Um, there is a natural tendency for people when they hear the last part of that, when unequals are treated equally, people's minds naturally go to people that are exploiting uh, the social safety net, people who are um, uh, taking an unfair share of, of, of government uh, subsidies, welfare, and that sort of thing, when in fact they could work. Um, that is what people's minds drift to when they hear that phrase. People's minds never drift to the fact that, is it really true that somebody whose wealth is 200 billion dollars that's approximately 2 million times what the average wealth is uh sorry the uh i should say the median household wealth in the united states is 2 million times that are they really working 2 million times harder are they really 2 million times smarter are they really 2 million times more valuable to society 
Um, if not, that's another example are, of when unequals are being treated equally. Um, or, 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 uh, it, so it, it, it depends perhaps, and, and maybe this goes to some of the observations that Professor Stancheva made, um, where you are on, on the wealth spectrum, how you perceive these things uh, begins to matter. Um, finally, I would say that even the concept of freedom means different things to different people depending on where they are on the wealth spectrum. If an average person hears about freedom of the press, they think that's great. I can read whatever I want to. I can uh, write whatever I want to on my web blog and so forth. Um, when a billionaire hears about freedom of the press, they think, great, I can buy up all of the media in this country and control what people hear and think. Um, those are two sort of opposing uh, ideas of what might be meant by freedom. And uh, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Professor Bogosian. I totally agree that freedom or inequality can mean different things to different individuals, uh, which is why perception gaps are so important uh, in understanding also designing public policies. So uh, next is Professor Morrow. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to Professor Wang uh, um question about the, the role of, uh, um, of the network in society. So most of the processes that are happening in society are happening in the network of relationships and the access that we have to these weak links, I mean, these opportunities, uh, the famous Granovetter hypothesis that most of the economic opportunities come through weak links, uh, people that are not our, let's say, family or our strong ties. Um, so th this is actually uh, to an, an, an our research is actually showing that different people have access to different, let's say, links and the different ties in, in the city. Uh, one important thing that we have found in, the, in our research is that even though uh, people have access to those different links, they exploit them differently. And the reason is because of education. So even if you come across an opportunity, for example, a weak link, someone that tells you a job or something like that, because they don't have enough tools, enough skills to actually uh, profit from that intervention, what we found is that even people that have the same social structure or the same access to weak links, people of less education, they actually benefit less from those weak links. So uh, we live in a network society and weak links uh, are important for all of us. But I think what we probably, um, and this is actually one of the roots of inequality that we see in, in our society, is that we don't have, we don't give people the right tools to actually improve or benefit from uh, this process. And education is actually something that we can see in the last probably uh, 30 years, uh, one of the one of the main, the core uh, consequences of that. So I agree uh, with Professor Wang Yili, uh, the, the network aspect of the, of the inequality is very important because most of the inequality is uh, uh, runs through the network. Uh, there are people which have no access to other opportunities and people which also have uh, more access to opportunities. There's the famous, uh, someone actually mentioned Barabasi uh, paper, but we have been working in complex networks. There are many phenomena in complex networks and in society. For example, the rich club, the fact that people which are rich tend to be closer to the rich people and the people more connected tend to be connected with people which are more connected, etc. There is the famous friendship paradox. Uh, rich people are always surrounded by people which are richer than them. So you always have a friend which is richer than you and you always have a friend which is poorer than you. Okay, and that's actually uh, something that I will leave to Stefani because I, I, I like very much the, the, the part about perception, which is actually another important aspect of inequality is behavioral economics, I think, is that how we react to policies and how we react to other people doing things around us. And one important aspect is that uh, the network is encoding a lot of these behavioral uh, um, biases of people. For example, there is the majority illusion, like the fact that you you think that you are surrounded by the majority of the society, which is you're not. For example, in our research, we found that the number of people that you see every every year in a city is 5,000 people. So we have this illusion that we are surrounded by the whole society that we go everywhere, but it's not true because 75% of your time, you spend it in five places. So that means that most of the people that you see is a very small, tiny village 
uh, and the city, and they can be very biased. So I leave it to Stephanie probably to tell us how these biases actually uh, transform the perceptions and how they, they are so important, for example, in policy making. Because most people, when you talk to them, they, they have a completely different view of, of what is surrounding you. Thank you, Professor Moro, for uh, the responses. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I have some comments about because of time. I just moved to the last speaker for uh, her response. Yes, I'll be very brief since uh, I see we're out of time. But uh, let me just say what I think is a key challenge um, to think about inequality policies. Uh, I think it's really people's understanding of economic policies that uh, can be improved a lot. And these are hard to understand policies. So uh, there's very little education on them, contrary to other things where we receive education on, which is very striking because these are policies that really affect our daily lives. And, uh, you know, we as citizens are asked to vote on them, to, to, choose, uh, to choose policies and policymakers with actually extremely little economic uh, and education on it. And so I think that is a key challenge and something that many countries can improve uh, and I think could be really beneficial for, for just giving people better tools to make decisions on policies that affect their lives. Yeah, we are just on time, but before we finish, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Lee if he has any further comments or last words. Yeah, uh, I wish I could have more time to talk with these wonderful speakers. Uh, it is surprising in very short time, I learned a lot and it was very instructive and, and inspiring for me. Uh, let me uh, finish my uh, remarks with the, uh, the American philosopher, John Searle. Uh, he made a distinction between two realities. The first one, institutional reality. So whereupon we are engaging in uh, about understanding and addressing the issue of inequality and social injustice is all the politics and government and system we have developed for the last 200 years is about institutional reality. On the other hand, there is uh, some natural reality. The one interesting point he made is that he called this natural reality is brute reality. So brute reality is brute is like uh, John Rawls. It's like when he's saying the brute reality of our differences. So one lesson I got from the physicists, engineers, and network scientists at the turn of the century is that uh, the brute reality is much more uh, prevailing than I have thought as a social scientist. So, uh, so that's why I, I think the works like the Professor Stan Chebers is, is based upon more realistic uh, assumption and understanding of human psychology and the, the way to we are understanding this world is, is becoming more pronounced in the future direction of the study of social inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Next time, I definitely invite you to <laughs> the keynote speech, okay? Thank you. So uh, we are almost uh, uh, done. Uh, thank you all the speakers and also the commentator, Professor Lee, for sharing your insights and knowledge on the greatest challenge of our time. We hope that the speeches and discussions we had today stimulate not only further research, but also real world actions to remedy the problems that we are seeing today. Okay, now we are ready to finish the forum with a closing remark by Vice President for Planning and Budget, Professor Bo Wong Kim, who also is a Professor of Operational Strategy and Management Science at the College of Business here. I take this opportunity to thank our distinguished speakers for sharing their knowledge and insights, which have helped to shed more light on the science of inequality and injustice. As a business school professor, I know the importance of trust as the backbone of global supply chain, whose disruption is recently causing the global economic as well as social pains across the world. Against this backdrop, I enjoy the great presentations and discussions today, which made me rethink 
how natural and social scientists can collaborate to tackle the world's greatest challenge at this time of economic downturns. I thank our audience who has joined the forum virtually or in person. Thank you all for your active participation. My thanks also go to the organizers of this forum, Professor Son Hoon, Director of the Global Strategy Institute, and also Professor So Young Kim, Director of the Korea Policy Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and their great teams who made great effort over the last few months to put this event together. To echo our president, solving the major problems of inequality and injustice calls for multidisciplinary solutions. In today's unique forum, we learned from economics, physics, math, and computational science to understand the science of inequality and injustice that plague our world to this day. I hope we all leave today's forum armed with the scientific knowledge and inspired to make the world a better place through our individual and collective contributions and capacities. I would like to end by inviting all of you again to the final GSI International Forum of KAIST, which will take place in November this year and will cover topics on renewable energies. With these few remarks, the forum is officially adjourned. I hope to see you all in November. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, and thank you all watching the forum live online this morning and this evening. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next forum in November. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>